Hey, I'm Aisha. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. I'm Charna Davis Weesey and welcome to UCF Profiles. Today we're going to talk about parenting and our children and maybe the issues we had as kids with Dr. Kimberly Rank. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rank. Dr. Rank is the director of the Understanding Children and Families Lab. You know, I was telling you that when my mother turned 80, she said to me, I looked in the mirror and an old lady was looking back and when I don't look in the mirror I'm the same as I was when I was 20 yeah. or 11 or 17 yeah. and even though we're going to talk about how we react to our children maybe we still have a lot of what we were as we were kids inside of us as well yeah and, and, and you know that that statement is really so simple but it's so profound in an interesting kind of way it was one of those boulders that hit you you know your parents tell you something yeah. and that was the, probably one of the biggest boulders because I, I think about that all the time. I, 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 didn't, I thought of her as being such, she was such a powerful per personality sure. and I never thought of her as not feeling that way, you know? Right, and I don't right. as a mother feel as, as I'm this powerful personality over my children's lives, but they may look at me in, in a totally different way. Yeah, and I would say that's definitely true. Um, but you know, to think about what you said, the thing that you opened us with, it, it's something that I think most parents need to get in better touch with, this idea that our history that we come with from being parented in our family of origin actually stays with us as we become parents ourselves and based on those experiences that we had as children and how we view our own parents actually affects indirectly, directly the way that we interact with our own children and even how we view their behaviors. You know, thinking about the interpretations we make of why is our child acting that way, why did they pick this situation to act that way, how is that affecting us now, um, are things that sometimes people don't think about and it's much easier to just react. You know, react to the child's behavior or you know, you're stressed out and so you react to what they're doing because you have a shorter fuse that day or however that's working in your family in any, any particular situation. When you talk about that, does it help? Because there are mm -hmm. some days when I, I'll, I'll yell at them yeah. out of nowhere for something really silly. Sure. And then I'll say to them, I don't know why I did that. I really feel stupid for doing that. Yeah. What you did was wrong, but I overreacted. And then I'm thinking, did I just negate everything that I told you? Right, <laughs> you know what right, I'm right. saying? But you never know as a parent which is the right way to go. I try sure. to be honest, but you know, then you beat yourself up for why do I react that way? Sure. <laughs> I'm the well, grown up. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are a lot of right things that you can do, and I think there's really not one set way to be as a parent. You really need to look at yourself and what feels comfortable to you and look at your children and what they bring to the table just because it is very much about the fit between you and your child rather than there being one way to parent correctly. I mean, certainly there are wrong things to do, um, like abuse and, and other issues related to domestic violence and, and conflict in families, um, but there are a lot of right things to do, and part of that is finding the way that you and your child work best together and finding the things that facilitate a positive relationship between the two of you. Right, and knowing deep down it's way more complicated than just right or wrong. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, most parents will beat themselves up about, oh, should I have done that? And was that the right thing to do? Have I damaged my child, you know, in rec uh, for, for the rest of their lives? How is that going to go? But what you said where you come back and you explain the circumstances and talk with them about what just happened for you and, and kind of come to some reconciliation about that and how they're feeling in response to those behaviors can be really helpful um, to circumstances like you described. Yeah, I, I found out with my kids that sometimes I, I would defend the little one a lot sure, sure. and tell them how he reacts to what they do or what they say and how he tries to be them because I was the youngest. Yeah. So I could really relate to them and finally, finally my oldest said, you know, what about me? Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank goodness he said that. Yeah. Because it, I was blind to it. It was new awareness, mm -hmm. you know. So tell me about, tell me about the, the, the lab. Okay. Where, where did that come about for you? 
Um, well, it came about in a roundabout kind of way, I guess. When I was in graduate school at the University of South Florida, I had a really wonderful mentor there, Dr. Vicki Fairs, and her interest lies in looking at the contribution that fathers make to families. And, and one of the things that she is very passionate about is the fact that fathers often get neglected in family research and looking at parenting styles because the focus historically has been just on moms and mom's contribution and certainly when you look at traditional family styles moms certainly are very critical to what goes on in households um, but she really wanted to look at dads and was very interested in looking at in general how parenting characteristics are related to the outcomes that children experience um, to the behavior problems that they have, to the issues that they face as they go through their development. And, and so she kind of fostered the, the shell for what I do now. But then something really lovely happened when I went on internship. Um, I was at the Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans. And I ran into some folks there that I was able to train with and got some really great training experiences. Dr. Joy Osofsky's group um, out there. And they were very interested in young children and looking at the early stages of what happens in families and what happens when early, early on children start to experience behavior problems and have difficulties in families and how the whole family system can actually shape what you see in your children. And so she provided the other piece to give me a very developmental approach to recognize that this can start much younger than I think most people realize. And, and then, you know, those early lessons that we get actually stay with us as we go through development, through childhood, through adolescence, and as we kind of launch from our family of origin um, to our own lives as adults. And, and so there were several pieces that kind of came together. Um, so when I got here to UCF, I had some eager graduate students waiting for me, um, mm -hmm. and I was actually just graduated from graduate school myself, so I was very new to being a professor. Um, but we started something really wonderful, and now we have an active group of graduate students that work with me looking at parenting issues, providing clinical services to folks in the community to try and improve how families function and to hopefully indirectly and directly change the way that, that children operate and, and the behaviors that they display. When you talk about them being very young, I remember mm -hmm. my little girl was about two years old and she yeah. said something that was very pithy. I don't remember what it was, very profound. And my mother-in-law said to her, where'd that come from? And she said, I think a lot of things I don't say. Oh, <laughs> neat. And it was like, you do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but then when my, my older one, my, my youngest was not much older and, and somebody very close to us had passed away. Aww. And I, I was telling somebody a few months later how well they were handling it. And he said, no, I'm not. Wow. So you don't realize when they're really little that they have these internal conversations that you sure. associate with much older children. Yeah. And it was, it, was a, it was a surprise to me to think that they were that intellectual and really thinking about things other than playing or yeah. when I'm going to get a cookie or who took, that, who took the bigger cookie or that they're more profound. Yeah. And, and I think that is something that is common to parents, that they don't think that kids observe as much as they actually do, that they consider things as carefully as they actually do, and, and certainly the idea that your child is keeping some of that in and not discussing that with you sometimes gets them in trouble because in their stage of development, whatever that is, they only have a limited amount of information to go with, and so they are going to draw explanations based on what they know of the world, which is actually, you know, just a small amount, even though they think it's, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so they come to conclusions that sometimes you may consider curious, but it's because they don't have all of the pieces of information or you didn't think to fill in the gaps and discuss as you're talking about that you do with your own children um, to give them the other pieces they need to really understand what goes on. You were talking about how relationships within a family affect yeah. children's behavior. I, years ago, was talking to a teacher and she had said that she was concerned about what she had perceived, and it wasn't scientific, it was just something that she was uh, uh, seeing yeah. in a middle school situation, how many children referred to a uh, clinical situation where they ended up being diagnosed as ADHD or mm -hmm. ADD sure. during a time when their parents were going through very nasty divorces. And sure. she said one after another that was coming across her desk as a teacher that this yeah. kid would be going 
and being suddenly was diagnosed, moved into another class, or being on medication. Sure. And that she felt that sometimes that possibly the stress was manifesting itself in another way, not being yeah. able to focus yeah. or other situations. Do you think that that's, that's could be an issue that divorce can and, and marriage problems can really affect the child that way? Sure, sure. You know, I think that's absolutely true. And, and I think that we have to remember that just because a child is acting in a certain way, we shouldn't jump to a conclusion that it's diagnostic of them. And, and I think you always have to consider a child's behavior in, in the context of the family system. Uh, and it's so important to consider the fact that as parents, you know, they see us in a certain way and when we are responding to stress and when we are having a difficult time, we may think that we put on a good face and they are not noticing, but children are so observant of their parents or the main caregivers in their life in particular because they always look to those people to see how to respond to their world. And so they are much more observant of how we feel, the symptoms that we are experiencing, whether we're, you know, have a cold or we're feeling sad that day. They will observe that. And certainly if you have days that line up where you are experiencing symptoms yourself, whether it's depression or anxiety or, or whatever the issue may be, children will be very aware of that and they'll be trying to make sense of that. And certainly sometimes that can affect how they look behaviorally and the things that they do because they're, there's so much, so much that they are considering in their world. And, and so sometimes stress in the family can absolutely make a child look very agitated or overactive or inattentive. I think we also as parents lose sight of how important and how bigger than life we appear to them. Absolutely. To, to us, we're just us, we're fragile, we have our issues and to them. Right. You're bigger than life until yeah. they're about, I guess, 21. Then they know everything, right? <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, certainly at 21, you, you feel like you know a lot of things, and you do mm -hmm. because you know you're you're starting your adult life and starting to see how things are going to work for you and making big decisions about what comes next. But these days, some of the research we've actually done in my lab really shows that as college students, college students today are much more connected to their moms and dads than perhaps we considered them being even 20 years ago. Um, with technology these days, everybody has a cell phone, you know, people are texting, calling home, and, and I think college students these days are still very integrated in the family system and using their moms and dads to still guide them even though they may be away at school or starting a career or whatever it is that they are doing. And, and so I think it's a little bit of a misnomer these days to think that adolescence ends at 18, where suddenly you're just an adult and you're going to go off and do your own thing. You know, I've heard that from other parents yeah. who have older children. That yeah. you know, I, I joke that that my my children are still far away from going to college, and sure. some of my friends have kids that are going to college, and I say I'm taking it worse than they are. Yeah. And my friends that have children in college, you know what? They text me ten times a day, and in the old days, when you were in college, it cost a lot of money to even call, sure. let sure. alone come home. Yeah. So maybe it was more of a cut in yeah. those days and she says oh yeah, can I can you send money <laughs> or right, right. <laughs> how do you make such and such <laughs> right, or right. oh my gosh I ruined my clothes in the washing machine what to do now yeah but they do maybe technology is helping keep it, keep the family together yeah. longer yeah definitely but I, I think family systems in general are kind of facilitating that I mean the economy is is what it is these days and, and certainly kids are staying closer to home they're not moving off on their own because it's not as affordable um, it's harder to get a job without having higher education. And, and so there are a lot more accommodations that families are making to allow children to take longer to launch to start their adult life and stay very integrated with each other. So how does the lab work? Um, well, the lab is very interesting. <laughs> it has been quite large at some times and is much smaller now than it was at one, at one point because I've had several students graduate this year but we have a very eager team of graduate students and really they are so helpful to me. I couldn't do as many things as I can without them. Um, they are just integral to everything that goes on. And so there are a couple pieces. We have a research leg of the lab, um, the, the PEARS lab, which looks at a lot of family issues in, in research, so how parents perceive their children, how parents' symptoms may affect or be related to the behavior problems that we see in children parenting issues that arise. So we examine all of that in a research piece in, in that leg of the lab. But then we also have the Young Child and Family Research Clinic, which is based in the psychology department in the new psychology clinic that we have there. 
and that research clinic actually allows us to provide services to families who have young children. So families who are already noticing that their children are having behavior problems, starting to have learning difficulties in school where the school is reluctant to test them because they are so young. Um, we are able to accommodate those families there and try and provide some assistance to them in parenting interventions, um, behavior therapy, assessment tools so that we can get that child on a better trajectory with their family and hopefully do better in the long run. I, I always ask this and it's, yeah, yeah. it's very, it's probably too simplified and maybe hard to answer, but is okay. there something that we do as parents over and over again, a common mistake we make? Um. Assuming well, they're not little individuals. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's an interesting line that you have to walk, isn't it? Because even so early, you know, I have a one-year-old at home and he's starting to walk, and, and you would think that at one, you know, he thinks it's the greatest thing to be able to get around on his own and he's getting into things, and that is his first step towards autonomy. Um, and, and so it's very difficult to walk that fine balance between allowing them to do enough on their own and help them feel accomplished but still protect them. You know, even my six-year-old. It's hard to do it when they're 15. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, right. You know, at six, he's like, okay, I can walk to my classroom by myself, Mom. And it's like, okay. <laughs> you know, it was my response rather than his, where he was feeling accomplished and grown up and wanting to do that. And for a parent to know where to say, okay, this is something he really needs to do on his own or she needs to do on their own. And finding that balance so you're not too over-controlling. Um, but still not too far away from them where they are feeling uncomfortable or feeling anxious because they are not able to do something. Do you think things. it's part of the, the time we are parents? Because sure. our parents, they used to, you know, we'd go out, we'd play, we'd do whatever and be back in time for dinner. Yeah. But our children are growing up in a world very that different. is very different much less of a feeling of safety. Definitely. You know, I, I worry about my children really never knowing anything pre-9-11. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's going to make them stronger because um, they don't have the fears that we did, mm -hmm. or is it affecting us, the post-9-11 world, affecting sure. us as parents more than it's affecting our kids, you know? It's a, it's a very, it's a lot of questions to ask us sure, about. Sure, sure. But, you know, the most important part of that that you bring up is the amount of stress that I think families are under these days. Both, you know, we mentioned the economy already today, um, but also dangers in our society, how we perceive the world these days because of things that are going on. Um, and, and it is very scary to parent. And, and even just to go day to day, you know, plenty of families are wondering, how am I going to put food on the table? Are we going to have enough money to get by this month? but also other things like, is my child in danger when they are out in the neighborhood? Where am I living and who, who lives in our neighborhood? And, and you know, families are much less connected to each other in school and neighborhood communities too to feel like there is a common parenting group where if you are so not watching. So it's not just our neighborhood? No, 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 <laughs> no. It's, I thought it's it was really just our neighborhood. Yeah, it, it's really quite interesting the climate that there is out there today. You know, we should be able to rely on each other as a community of adults watching out for the next generation, and I feel like some of that has gotten lost these days. Right, and you don't know how to bring it back. Yeah. I guess you have to fi find your own network somewhere. Definitely. And be aware that you have to look for it. Right, right. And you just feel that there's something missing. You don't know what it is that's missing. Sure, and, and you know, if you're lucky, you have a really strong family unit from your family of origin, and those individuals are there to help you or you have a really lovely social network from work or from your neighborhood if you've been fortunate and, and you can rely on other people then to help you parent your children as you would see fit and certainly people have to look for individuals that share a common philosophy. Uh, you know there are a lot of different ideas about what is acceptable for children these days and people have different standards and certainly you have to find what is going to work for you. You also did research on post uh, disaster mm -hmm. situations with kids, yeah. especially living here in Florida. It seemed sure. like we had, for our kids, your kid, your, your older one, maybe is a little little young young yeah. for it, they had the 9-11 situation, they had all of that, then they had the four hurricanes in one year. Right, right. So we went without power for a, lo for a long time, and I, I don't know sure. how, it, how it's affecting them. They seem to be, well, we got over it, we got through that, we're sure, stronger. Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, is there an effect on kids post-hurricane, post-trauma yeah. they see on television? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the study that you're mentioning, we had actually done a study right after the four hurricanes had come through the Florida, Florida, state of Florida, 
um, with several of them affecting the Central Florida area. And, and certainly people responded to that, and there were lots of behavioral issues that arose. And even anecdotally through the clinic at the time, we had lots of parents calling in um, saying, you know, the kids are watching TV, they keep talking about, you know, the Weather Channel being on, and why do these news people keep coming on talking about this? And kids were worried that there were things going on all of the time, rather than understanding that there was one hurricane that was coming through and all of the news coverage was from that. And, and so again, you get into how they are perceiving their environment, and you have to fill in the gaps of the pieces they need to feel more comfortable. But certainly that can have an effect. But, you know, saying that, I feel very fortunate to have had so little damage in our area from the hurricanes that came through, especially when you compare to something like Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans and the devastation that occurred in that city. And, and folks that I used to work with on internship really worked very hard to provide some interventions to families who were coming back to the city of New Orleans, um, the first responders and their families who were staying on, on cruise ships while they were investigating the city to see what the extent of the damage was and looking for survivors and all of the things that had to take place because when it's such an immediate impact like that where it affects so many systems that children are involved with certainly you can expect that the effect on their behavior and their emotional functioning is going to be so much greater it, it can just be exponential and, and so all of those things are a concern on top of all of the daily issues that families deal with. Is there also a danger of keeping them away from, uh, unaware of it? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say yes. Um, you know, it's very difficult to strike a good balance in providing developmentally appropriate information because you don't want to give too much, but you don't want to not say anything and disguise what's going on because they will sense what's going on. They hear parents talking on the telephone to other people. They say, oh, it's nothing. That right, makes right. the same way even worse. And, and you know, they think in their head, well, why is mom or dad talking to so-and-so about these you know, issues? What exactly is going on? And certainly you want to inform them in a way that they can understand what, what is happening and not make them too afraid. But certainly let them know that there, there is something that's happening that's pretty I've big. told my kids, you know, working in news for so many years, I say, that's why they call it news. That's why it's right. on TV. It doesn't really happen that often. Right, right. And yeah, can happen. Well, let's see what we can do to help. Yeah. And, you know, like, like I said, you never know as a parent, did I do the right thing? You hope. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, you know, you have lots of chances. That's the nice thing with parenting. <laughs> it, it's not like a one-time incident necessarily is going to make or break your relationship with your child. You know, even when you talk about young children, little ones, babies, when we talk about attachment and, and that relationship that they form with their caregivers, um, it takes many, many instances of interaction. It's not just a one-stop shop where you get one chance and that's it. Um, and, and so you can build your relationship or change the direction if something is not going the way that you like if everything else is in place in your family. I guess the biggest thing is taking the time to take a look at it. Exactly. And we're always rushing from thing to thing to thing right. to thing, but you actually take a time, well, let's see, how did this, how this happen? How does this feel? Right. How's it working? Try to get them to talk to you. I find with my, you know, now having a teenager, he's going to be 15, oh. that it, he, unless I feed him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't see him. <laughs> now, well, he, he's sh he shuts down. He's, he doesn't talk. Oh. <laughs> then when I feed him, I'm thinking maybe it's a blood sugar <laughs> level thing or yeah, something. Yeah. But, you know, you... I, I had to take the time to say, okay, why is he getting in the car after school and he's not saying anything? Right. But once they feed him, he's okay. Yeah. So sometimes it may be more than, more than just emotional things going on, too. Sure. Well, and, and you always have to work on that relationship. You know, it, it, I, I think a lot of parents have this idea that they are the parent, and, and so that buys them something, and certainly it does. But to it doesn't really buy you access into what's going on, right. necessarily. And, and certainly you have to think about how are you earning the respect of your children, and, and how is that relationship going, and how is that fostering their needs, um, rather than just considering the day-to-day -day things. I mean, it's easy to sit down and, and pay bills and watch TV and take some time for yourself, and then when your son or daughter comes up and says, you know, we need some time, um, and for you to say, well, just a minute, but for them, you know, they're waiting for you. You know, that's quite important. Right. Dr. Rank, believe it or not, our time is up. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you for joining us, oh, and sure. we Thanks hope you come me. back and vi visit us again next time. Definitely, I would love that. Thank you, and thank you for watching. I'm Charter Davis-Weesey. We'll see you again next time on UCF Profiles.